Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the BLK FLA experience. We are the cultural archive for the Black political movement in the state of Florida, where our purpose is to help you reimagine a Florida where Black people are able to live in freedom, equity, and authenticity. I'm your host, Jamal Steele, and we are taking this time to dive into all things Black politics and Black culture. So let's get into it. Um, I, I feel like I say this all the time, but these people are really actually my friends. Like, I this isn't really like a thing where I'm I'm being Hollywood with it, but <laughs> I just have the honor of being able to bring awesome friends on the show who you all just so happen to know as some of the most ridiculously awesome people in black politics and black organizing. In the state of Florida. This time around, I have the amazing, incomparable Michelle Rayner, state representative Michelle Rayner. Period. And it's my Delta anniversary if we're going to talk about it. So. Let's, no, let's get it. No. Shout out to the, the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Period. Period. <laughs> so, um, no, because I always like to make sure that whenever we bring guests on that just so happen to be part of the Divine Nine, I got to shout out that Divine Nine because um, our last guest that was that was the D9 affiliated. Shout out to my guy, um, former state house rep and 2018 Democratic nominee for attorney general. The my guy. Of Sean the- Sean. Be Omega Sci-Fi <laughs> Fraternity get, Incorporated. Get it right. Get it right. Let's, listen, I I understand. I understand. Never, never place the root to the good cues. We love them. We love them. We do. We absolutely do. Ne- never place the frat, but I understand what what everybody has to go through to get these to get these letters. It's a, yeah. it's a thing. It's a lot. It's a lot. And we just brought through a lot of girls here in St. Pete last night. And child, I, I am tired, 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 tired. I, I understand because that, that's a that's a week. That's that's a week. And it's a oh, it's more than a week for us. Some other organizations, some some other sororities, it may be like, you know, a couple of days. But for us, it's a it's a uh, it's a process. But yes, it is. It's a lot. And friend, we uh, they cross us night and they probate it. And I'm tired. <laughs> but I'm here with you because there's nah, no in the world I'd rather be but here with you nah and I appreciate it I appreciate it we've been trying to get this together for a minute but thank you thank yes. you for, for rolling through of course of course so, absolute thank you so um, we're going to get right into it so we're going to get into our what we talking about segment um, before we get into our what we talking about segment um, I have to go into a piece of piece of personal family business that I have to take care of right quick. So April the 13th of this year, um, I, even though I really, really, really enjoy being in Florida and rep Florida politics and rep Florida Black organizing really hard, I am a product of the city of Atlanta. Um, everybody knows that. So April the 13th of this year, we in the city of Atlanta lost who we consider to be a cultural icon, a cultural musical icon, someone that I would consider to be Atlanta's Atlanta's Quincy Jones, Atlanta's Dr. Dre, Atlanta's um, Atlanta's Diddy, um, Atlanta's Diddy, but no Diddy. Atlanta's but no Diddy, but no Diddy. Yes, that's it. Uh, yes, absolutely. Because if you talk to anybody, if you talk to anybody else about this person, they will let you know that he was one of the kindest, most um, kindest, most awesome gentlemen that you would ever meet in your life. And he was literally right around the way from where I'm from in Atlanta, right in Southwest Atlanta. 
um, Southwest Atlanta, Campbellton Road, all the things. Um, April 13th, we lost Rico Wade, who is one third of what I consider to be the greatest production team in all of music, Organized Noise. I'm completely biased because <laughs> I'm, I'm completely biased just a little bit because Organized Noise is comprised of Rico Wade, Ray Murray, and my cousin who we grew up we grew up more like we were brothers, more so than cousins. Um, and that's my cousin, Sleepy Brown. Y'all y'all know him as Sleepy Brown. I just know him as as, as Pat, Patrick Brown. Um, Organized Noise is a production trio who founded the music collective known as the Dungeon Family. The Dungeon Family is comprised of Goody Mob, Outkast, Cool Breeze, Witch Doctor, Killer Mike, Future. Future is act. Future is an actual member of the Dungeon Family. Not too many people know that. Um, and just how I am with Sleepy Brown, that's how Future is with Rico Wade. Future is actually Rico's cousin. Um, Future was. Many people will know that Future was Rocco's artist, but it was Rico Wade who actually walked Future into the office of L.A. Reid to get him his deal with um, with L.A. Reid. Um, many people know me also to be, uh, along with being an organizer, they also know me to be an artist. I, I rap, sing, all of the things. Um, but when I first started doing music, I only really started rapping because I wanted to impress my older brother and his two friends. That's 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 literally all it was. I've had the pleasure of meeting Rico way twice in my life. And both times Rico was nice enough to really just give me a lot of knowledge on how to move, not only just in the music industry, but just move in how I really wanted to in life and just to like just to understand how to grind and be persistent and make sure that you never make enemies with any of the people that you come um, come along along the way because you're going, he was like, I guarantee you, you're going to need one of the people one day. You're going to need one of the people one day in life. And I will never forget the and just the two times that we met, just the influence that he had over my life and just the overall influence that Organized Noise as a production team had over not just my life, but many other people's lives in the city of Atlanta um, and in the world. Like not too many people know that Organized Noise, Organized Noise wrote, co-wrote and produced TLC's Waterfalls. Um, you don't get TLC's Waterfalls without Rico Wade. You don't get In Vogue's Don't Let Go from the Set It Off soundtrack without Rico Wade. You don't get you don't get Outkast's first three albums um, and pretty much their entire career without Rico Wade. Um, and anybody who's a fan of Jamal Steele as an MC and an artist, this guy. You don't get any of that without Rico Wade, Sleepy Brown, and Ray Murray. You don't get this podcast without them. Um, because me as an artist is what got me in the door to being an organizer and, if, and essentially being an organizer with the organization that I'm with now, which is Black Voters Matter. And I don't get any of that without being from Atlanta, and allowing the legacy that Organized Noise, Dungeon Family built to be embedded within me. And I just want to make sure that those three men in particular, Rico Wade, Ray Murray, and my cousin, Sleepy Brown, understands and knows how much they really mean to me and how much the soundtrack that they built for the culture that is the city of Atlanta really 
means to me. Um, and so that's it. That's that's my that's my tribute. That's my spiel. Um, and so let's get right into it. Let's get into this. What we let's get into this. What we talking talking about segment. Um, because you know I've held that in. I've held that in for for a little bit. And um, I also want to say to people that's reached out that's reached out to me during this particular time. Um, thank y'all. You know, Rico necessarily wasn't the family member, but he is the close friend of my family member. Like Rico, Rico and Sleepy knew each other since high school. So this is like a 30, 30, this is like a 30, almost 35 year partnership friendship that grew and blossomed into everything that you see on TV and whatnot. Um, so I just want to thank people for who's reached out, who's just sent condolences and well wishes. Um, it's appreciative, but I really want y'all to send those well wishes to, and condolences to the Wade family, um, his wife and his children, and of course the musical family, um, the dungeon family, because, um, we are going through it right now. So that's, that's all. So let's get into it. Um, what we talking about for today. I, I I really want to have this conversation with you. Um, I really want to have this conversation with you, Michelle, because I understand that not only do we move in the space of Florida politics and Florida state politics, we also move in the space of um we also move in the space of Black Christianity, mm-hmm. um, and not just and not just you, but like the both of us. We, mm-hmm. we move in the space of Black Christianity. I'm I'm a PK through through and through. Um, shout out to my stepfather, uh, Pastor Alfonso Williams Jr., um, evangelist within the church within the Church of God in Christ. Yes, Period. I'm, I'm Period. a Kojic kid. I'm a Kojic kid. Same. So, same. 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 Okay. <laughs> Okay, like, yeah, you learn something new every day. All right. Um, So (laughs) you understand all of you understand all of the things, the highs and lows of the Church of God in Christ. I do. Sometimes the Church of God in cash. Um, (laughs) Yes. So um, I I, I read an article a few years ago. I'll say two, two, maybe three years ago, um, which states that. Millennials and Gen Zers are having a decline as far as attendance and participation within the the Black church. Um, Some of this is attributed to the current disconnect that the Black church has Mm -hmm. with Black politics and Black political organizing um, within the within the country. I am starting to see a slight resurgence here in the state of Florida. I know it's it's very surprising, but I've I'm having a lot of Black churches reach out to me and Black pastors reach out to me, stating that they want to start doing a lot of organizing and start to do a lot of um, mobilization as it pertains to this year's, Mm -hmm. this year's election. Um, Some of it, you know, I'm very optimistic about some of it. I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant about because we kind of get the same thing, like every two to four, every two to four years from the, the black church. I also start, I also, I also want for, certain higher level state and federal elected officials to stop using the black church as a vehicle for their campaign stump speeches and coming up in the spot, like maybe the last two, two to three months of the general, not even the primary, like he had slept on in the primary, but the general 
And so I, I think my question for you is, why do you feel that there's a sudden disconnect? There's this disconnect between the Black church and those who move in movement spaces and what are what can be done to reestablish the black church as a as the epicenter if you will for um this movement that we call black liberation yeah i mean um that's a loaded question <laughs> You know, no, no big deal. No big deal at all. I'm actually looking up this particular pastor that I follow. There's several of them. So at first, I think that it's one, thank you for having me on. But I also, Christian, I think this is his name. Um, yes. Um, so a couple of things. I, so one, I think we have to get back and level said that there was a time that Black liberation theology as founded by James Cone, but really founded by Howard Thurman. I'm not going to give y'all a Google list and please Google those names. Howard Thurman. Please do. Uh, James Cone, um, Katie Cannon, even when we were thinking about Audrey Lord, who is not necessarily a theologian, but also was wrapped around womanist theology, Alice Walker. I mean, Pamela Lightsey, who's still alive right now, who was very much still alive, Reverend Dr. Pamela uh, Pamela Leipzig. Um, there's so many I can think of. Carlton Pearson. Obviously, when we think about Black liberation theology, it was basically the, the the matter of that Christianity was about less about cars and cash and all these things, but about how do we collectively get free. And when you look at the story of Jesus about getting free and what freedom looks like and redemption looks like, and how that looks like through the lens of liberation, that is what carried people through in the civil rights movement. That is what preachers were preaching in the midst of complete darkness. And so for those who don't know, I am a lawyer. I am state rep. I am uh, not a theology school dropout per se. I'm taking a leave of absence right now because <laughs> I'm busy and I've had a lot of life happen. But um, so I, everything I do, everything I frame is through the work of the, the framing of movement and the framing of liberation. And so I think really what has happened and not to castigate the whole black church, but, you know, there are some, you know, especially younger folks like Christian Smith out of uh, out of um, Atlanta, who's younger, who's preaching a, a, a gospel that I think is actually uh, more in line with the gospel is an inclusive gospel, a gospel that is uh, that is challenging what we think the, the the norms, especially norms of heteronormativity, all those kinds of things. I think that you know um, that is why we're seeing the shift. But what has driven a lot of people away is that you know we are we when you know better you do better when you're when you're learning and leaning into more of the things of of, you know, African spirituality, but also really having the conversations with the church of, you know, when Black people are murdered, I don't want you to tell me to tithe more, right? When Black people are being killed in the street and they are victims of state-sanctioned violence, mm -hmm. I don't need you to tell me that I, if you didn't listen, because you didn't listen to your pastor or because you're shacking up with someone, quote unquote, or because you're doing this, this is what happened. You're not... What, you have a majority of pastors and I can't talk about, you know, white people. I can talk about black pastors. I can specifically talk about the church of God in Christ. Cause that's what I was born in. My grandfather was an apostolic Bishop. Um, I can talk about when you're not speaking to what people are actually going through. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the economic and injustices and the housing injustices and the housing quality. But when we are talking about, you can't speak to the base level of, Black people getting shot and killed and dying in the streets or victims of state sanctioned violence or police brutality. And your answer is you need to pay more money. You need to do this. And it's very and it's based in a very white supremacist, capitalistic uh, centered theology. Who wants to sit in church? Who wants to sit? I don't want to sit in church. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sit through that. Do you want to sit through that? And so I think that you know, the answer really becomes that you have to have people be able to speak to where folks are at, not only what and not only speaking to the, you know, this, you know, issues of 
you know, state sanctioned violence and racial inequality, but like, how does that pour over into what they're experiencing economically? How does that pour over into what they're experiencing, you know, with housing and with all these other issues? And so I think for me, that when you don't give a message that is speaking directly to that, and you have people who are really experiencing real life things, but you say that me being queer is a problem, you say me being whatever is this, and that has nothing to do with what I'm going on. And if I would just quote unquote live right, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't be experiencing what I'm experiencing. But your living right is based in a, a, a white supremacist heteronormative framework. I think that that's not speaking to what people are actually going through. And that's why I think that, you know, the church has lost some of its influence within the organizing space and has lost some of its influence within um, the political space. And that's why sometimes people, even black leaders say, you know, I'll I'll get to y'all when I get to y'all. Hmm. I will get to y'all when I, that's uh, (laughs) So I, I, I took so someone who's a preacher. I'm a preacher. So this is someone who's a preacher. Listen, I, I took so much from that. Um so, so let's also touch on the let's also touch on the black church's lack of <laughs> inclusion from a from a messaging standpoint, but not necessarily from a participation standpoint. And mm-hmm. I, and, and I, I, I say that in the sense of the message isn't as inclusive as it should be, mm-hmm. but your, your music department, your usher department, um, I, and, and we can just leave really at that. Like you, you know, I mean, even even go you and expand your music department, your evangelist department, your usher department, your hospitality department. Every piece of the church has queer people in it. Has queer people in it. Has people in it who may be partnered, uh, who may be in a par- heterosexual partnered relationship, but not, um, but not um, uh, married, who have had children outside of quote unquote wedlock. Every major department has somebody in here. And of course there's, we know like not to be stupid. We know that there's levels of like acceptance, right? right. So we know the least accepted is queer folks. Right. And then the least accepted is queer black men. And then, you know, and then, then and so forth and so on, you know, because people have asked me, well, you're queer, you're openly queer. How do you get in the pulpits? I was like, cause I'm a black woman and I'm pretty. So that, so, I mean, and that's, and that's real. Right. And that, and I, and I preach about that and I call them out on that. The only reason that I'm in your pulpit is I'm black. I'm a woman. I'm pretty. And I have a platform. Mm-hmm. If I was a man, queer man, be, be for real. If I was a woman that wasn't pin presenting, be for real. But be for real. And if I was a woman that wasn't pin presenting and didn't have a platform, be for real. We got to reckon with that. We got to reckon with that because at the end of the day, if we really want to have a conversation, let's talk about Jesus. May or may not have been a eunuch. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the people you hold up, who you hold to high esteem. I mean, like we're not having the honest conversation because the theology that we are, 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 are leaning into is, is one incorrect theology, but number two, it is, it is a theology that it was based out of oppression of our people. And, um, and we as black folks sometimes have become even better than white folks at oppressing our own. Yes. I, I, so one of the things I, so one of the things I do have to speak on as it pertains to the black church is so here in the state of Florida on this year's awesome, incredible ballot, we have two ballot initiatives Mm -hmm. that I feel and Mm -hmm. you being who you are, I I feel like you feel, you may feel the same way could be driving forces in increasing black 
voter turnout this year if these ballot initiatives are the the messaging around these ballot initiatives have that messaging where black people can relate to it and that's amendment amendment three and amendment four Mm -hmm. um so one so amendment four is the the one that i'd like to um I'd like to focus on because um, my last guest that I had had on um, our senior policy manager for Black Voters Matter, Ryan Wagner, um, I, I said this to her. Black people, while historically voting in a liberal slash progressive sense, have principles and ideologies that at times lean very much so conservative. Uh And abortion is one of them. Uh And I've had, I've had pastors say to me either, how do we have this conversation with our congregation? Or um, when we have this conversation about these ballot initiatives, we're we're speaking from a C three sense, right? We the you know because these these ballot initiatives are are are, are very part are very partisan driven, which I don't believe they are. I feel like you don't believe they are, um, mm-hmm. but it's to me, and 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 it was also brought up during our our last episode, the conversation around Amendment Four. It really should be driven the, the healthcare conversation and the repro justice conversation should be the driving force behind this. And and even in those, you're still gonna have the conversation about abortion and the choice mm-hmm. of it. And so from your perspective and standpoint, how do we even how how does the black church even engage in the conversations around honestly both honestly both amendments because you know they also don't want to have the conversation about why uh, amendment three should be a um, a topic that they should discuss because they don't want to discuss anything about as they like to call it the devil's lettuce. Um, your your thoughts. So I would say, you know, when we say trust black women, that was not something that just came because like it was cutesy and whatever. Trust black women actually came out of the reproductive justice movement, basically actually starting in Atlanta. Right. And basically it was a group of black um, women and femmes that um, when the whole especially like probably like. 90, like probably mid nineties where like this conversation with around row started really coming to the forefront that there, and then, um, and then the two, and then the two two thousands that the black women and femmes in Atlanta said, you know, specifically there was a couple of issues and I can't recall it right now where that you ought to trust black women to be able to make decisions about their body, about when to have children, if they want to have children, how they want to have children and the ability to raise those children if they decide to have them in a safe and healthy environment that's financially stable. And so when I say also trust Black women, I'm pushing it forward that I think Black women should be leading this conversation. And one of the things that I have taken issue and I've been critically and vocally a vocal about is that I don't think with regard to this specific issue in the state of Florida, but also nationally, that we are bringing in enough Black women's voices to actually have the conversation. You bring in Black women when like, oh, like it's not hitting too much in the Black community. Black women ought to actually be leading, period, in this because it is Black women that are going to, Black women and femmes, that are going to be most harmed if this amendment doesn't pass. 
It is Black women in FEMS that are going to be most affected if this amendment doesn't pass in the state of Florida. It is Black women in FEMS that have a higher rate of child, higher rate of death during childbirth and, and, and reproductive health issues than their white counterparts. So when we, and what has happened and what has been a disservice to this issue, that this has become a white woman's situation, a white woman led and, and there's no shade to my white sisters who are in this work. I, I appreciate the work that they do. And the, I thank God for their voices. But at some point, where when are we going to allow Black women and fins on a national level? I mean, we have Sister Song and, and or other organ, Black Feminist Future and all of those kinds of things who, who are tremendous organizations who are leading in their own right. But to me... I'm not going to name any other organizations, but some organizations need to step back and maybe let Sister Song do this or Black Feminist Feature do this. Like, maybe we really trust Black women because when then when you parlay that into thinking about how the church is, Black women have been having conversations about reproductive justice forever. This is nothing new in our community. We just don't name it the way that y'all name it. Absolutely. You know, name it the way the other folks name it. Black women know what has black women knew how to have, you know, abortions, quote, quote unquote, without going to the doctor. If you eat this, if you take this, mm. this will produce this. Black women also knew how to prevent pregnancy. If you eat this, if you take this, we will you won't get pregnant. That has been a thing. Always. We knew that there was a lady down the street that you could go to and she could give you something to drink or eat, mm -hmm. or whatever. Or if your, you know, your menstrual cycle was too heavy, but you couldn't, we've been having this conversation, but when you don't allow black women to lead and to be able to message the conversation to the church, and it's just about, well, you either get abortion or you don't, or you don't understand the cultural nuances of, well, you know, a child, you know, a, a 14 year old shouldn't have to tell their parents, Cool, I get it, right? Because there's sometimes it may be unsafe, but think about the cultural nuances of that. When you center this in a lens that is a white lens and you don't have anybody that looks like me talking about it to people who may not be as politically locked in, but you know, so it's incumbent upon us, those that look like us, that look like me, look like you, that we have these conversations with our community and have these conversations in the church and have these conversations outside. Because let me tell you, I've knocked doors and there have been black women that have been like, I think it's absolutely ridiculous what they're doing. I think it's ridiculous that there's no ban. It's not their business, but they're not 90% of those women are not going to feel comfortable having a conversation like that with someone that don't look like them. So, you know, my thing is don't trust black women when it's time to trust them because y'all done messed up and y'all don't know how to message to people. Mm. Trust black women from jump. This this podcast gonna get me in trouble. Spoken, <laughs> spoken like a true spoke spoken like a true person from the Tampa St. Pete area. Um <laughs> shout out to my Pinellas other County, Pinellas County through and through. <laughs> Shout out to my other sister from the Tampa St. Pete area, the Maya Brown. The um, Maya Brown, period. Full stop. No, uh, because these are similar. <laughs> these are these are similar answers that I've heard from her. So um I think no, I think that is the best way to I think that's the best way to end this segment because at, at the end of the day, we have to. We have to be able to be the ones to control the narrative around these issues and be the ones who stand flat foot on how this messaging comes across in pulpits, panel discussions, um, outside stump sermons, what have you, mm -hmm. so that it's understood that the the black church sees sees the issues that are going on and it's not just we'll pray about it and have faith that pray about it and have faith that the lord will work it out 
Um, mm. And also, um, shout out to organizations like Black Church Pack. Um, Pride in the Pews. Pride in the Pews. Yes, absolutely. No. Just, I just was with them in February doing, like, you know what I mean? Shout out to Pride in the Pews. Phenom- phenomenal organization. And I did see all, and I did see all of the um, Instagram stories during the time that you were with them in, in February, which is actually how I came to actually know the the organization as well so um shout out to them as well. like no very dynamic um and very very dynamic and very inclusive organizations that are trying to um reshape the narrative of how the black church should be looking in this modern movement so let's continue um because yeah. I'm, I'm enjoying our com- I am enjoying our conversation already and we ain't even like really got knee deep into it yet <laughs> so, <laughs> um once again I get the honor and the privilege of interviewing my good friend state representative Michelle Rayner uh-huh. um, so friend we do this thing it's called top fives so okay. you get to have two top fives one top five is your top five musical artists. They can be from whatever genre, all the things. Your top, your top five musical artists, because we are the intersection of black politics and black culture within the state of Florida. Oh God, top five musical artists. This is so hard. Like this is not even like fair. <laughs> oh my God, because it changes. So it's okay. Let me let me maybe start with the staples. The staples are Beyonce. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, let me, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Beyonce, Giselle Knowles Carter. So mm. that's number one. Um, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, uh, D'Angelo, mm. um, especially the Black Messiah album, like Chef's Kiss. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a curveball, and this and this is very hard because I'm leaving out like Maxwell. I'm leaving out so much. I'm gonna throw a curveball to you, um, John Mayer. John Mayer, okay, John Mayer. no, yeah, hands down, yeah. Hands down. <laughs> John, Mayer. Hands down. Hands down. John Mayer is like on the playlist. Like he's like in, always in heavy rotation. Period. Um, <laughs> no, we, you and I have connected very strongly. You yeah. and I have connected. Well, that very was hard. That, I, I was very stressed about that just now. <laughs> that was very stressful. You and I have connected very strongly over our um, affinity of the Black Messiah album by D'Angelo. Like it's Chef's Kiss. Like Listen. it's literally like one of the most underrated albums, and it's like actually a perf- a perfect album. It really is. It's Thank legitimate. You. D'Angelo, if you're listening to this, it's a perfect album. I'll stop you're listening to this. My phone number is. But just kidding. <laughs> Period. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, it's 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 a perfect album. It's a perfect album. It is. And it actually and and it actually came out like when it actually premiered, it came out on my birthday. So oh, it, was wow. literally like, it was literally like the greatest birthday present I could ever receive because I'm a huge D'Angelo fan. And, you know, he 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 did he he pulled the he pulled the Beyonce move with it and just like mm-hmm. released it. It was just like, like here y'all go. <laughs> here y'all go. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. No, it's perfect. Everything about it is, yeah. is, is, is remarkable. Oh, so okay. your other top five uh, is yeah. top five black organizers or cultural figures that have influenced you to be in the space you are in now? So my first one is my mom. She, for those who don't know, my mother just passed almost a year ago. She was part of the USF-8 that integrated the University of South Florida. So um, so my mom, for sure. Um I would say it's Chelsea Fuller. For those who do not know who she is, she runs Black Alder, but she's also the comms uh, guru for Movement for Black Lives um, and for BL. And she's a dear friend and always pushes me out of my box to be better than what I am. I would say David Johns. He um, is the executive director for National Black Justice Coalition. Um, I would say Fannie Lou Hamer. Never met her, never knew her, but... Her 
way that she showed up and the authentic authenticity and what she did um, has has always been a guiding light for me. And then I would say, I mean, it's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. So I drew Lord. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah. So um, yeah, those would um, be my five. It's funny because every guest you make number four, every guest that we've had on here, Fannie Lou Hamer has been in, uh, in every one of their lists. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's just, uh, I mean, I think she is the epitome of someone who was, quote, unquote, not political, quote, unquote, didn't have the, quote, unquote, resume to be where she was at um, and said, you know, okay, I'm going to make a table. I'm going to, I'm going to do what I need to do. Like, I'm going to, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. right? And um, I think that for me, she's one of like the pinnacle. Uh, Amazing. So let's begin. We are going to give you a name. We're going to give you the background behind that name. Okay. And we are going to, once we give you the background behind that name, you will give us <laughs> the distinct meaning behind that name. So, okay. on, so on July 19th of 2018, mm-hmm. um, a 28-year-old Black man by the name of Marquise McLaughlin um, was fatally shot at a convenience store yeah. in... Clearwater mm-hmm. in the, the Clearwater St. Pete area. Mm-hmm. Um, doing my research on my my friend, I find out, which I already knew this because shout out to shout out to BET and and The Rock. <laughs> the Rock, the Rock of all people. Like, you know. Um there was a there was a special that came on BT and it addressed stand your ground laws, all of the things. It had two of my dynamic other friends in the movement, um, Jay James and the Ashley Green, um, yep. AG, um, AG of the bat of the bad squad. Mm -hmm. Um, of Dream Defenders. Um, But that was also the first time that I was introduced to this remarkable lawyer by the name of Michelle Rayner. Um, You were the family lawyer Mm -hmm. for the family of Marquise McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. Um, How did that come about? And what were some of the lessons that you learned going through that experience with the family and more so with the movement at large mm. in, in, in the Bay area. Yeah. Well, um, so yeah, well, Marquis McLaughlin, um, so interesting fact, like he, from where my parents' house is, it's probably about, it's literally directly down the street. It's probably about maybe two miles. If that, down the street. It feels longer because it takes a while, but it's about two miles down the street from my parents' house. I actually used to drive past that convenience store almost every Sunday and Wednesday and Friday night. Shout out to Church of God in Christ of my life, headed to mm-hmm. church. Um, so I'm very clear about where that was. Um, I had heard about it. Um, I was called and I was like, you know, in my office at that time was in Clearwater. Um, and I was like, okay. And I was like, this is, you know, gotta stop. Um, and I actually just was marching because like I had been involved in movement work, um, representing other families who were victims of state sanctioned violence. And I was actually out in a sorority t-shirt with, uh, my sorors, my line sisters, um, my, I was just out there protesting. People had asked me to speak. My line sister, unbeknownst to me, <laughs> walked up to the family and was like, do you have a lawyer? And they're like, no, they're like, this is my line sister. You need to hire. I had no idea this conversation was taking place. <laughs> um, and I get a call 
the next morning from Michael McLaughlin. And I said, come in my office. And we had a conversation. And um, I will tell you, um, I have represented other families and there's other cases that y'all could look up. And I never... I always go into cases and I know this is probably like, uh, this is going to be super transparent. Every case I get that is one that is of, and all of them are of significance. So let me be very clear. All of them are of significance. But when I get cases that are maybe this a little bit more weightier than others, I always go in very nervous, almost with some self doubt of like, can I do this? Mm. And not in the ego sense of can I do this and when, but these people have already lost so much. I can't add to that loss, right? I can't fuck up. And I'm sorry if you're not allowed to cuss, you can edit it. You love shit. This is this is the realest podcast you ever Uh, probably probably uh, (laughs) made. I can't I can't fuck up and add to more of their loss. And um, so I was really nervous Uh, at that time. Ben Crump was representing the girlfriend of um, Mr. McLaughlin. And I I think girlfriend is not even not even the best way. His partner. I mean, they have four kids together, three, three kids together. And then she was actually unbeknownst to her and him while when this happened, she was pregnant with their fourth. Right. And um, I. It changed my life, right? It changed my life because I think it put me on a trajectory that I don't know I otherwise would have been on. Um, It made me really see, um, you know, when we go to Tallahassee and we like take votes, it's easy to be like, "Hmm," people are just pressing buttons. And the reason that Mr. McLaughlin's killer wasn't arrested for, you know, over 24 days is because there was a law called Stand Your Ground, right? right? And people voted for that law. And I remember Mr. McLaughlin, uh, Mike McLaughlin, uh, Marquise's dad said to me, you know, like I knew of the Stand Your Ground thing. I heard about it. I, I, I knew what happened to Trayvon Martin, but I never thought it would come to my house. I never thought it would come knocking to my house. And that whole case and dealing with that put me on trajectory, which is why I, one of the reasons I, I I strongly think I'm in the legislature now and um, I've continued to do the work that I've, I do. Um, and I mean, it has, you know, I have been followed by law enforcement <laughs> to my home. I have had law enforcement sit out in the parking lot of my firm. I have had the most vile, threatening voicemails and letters and all those kinds of things. Um, But it's also made me fearless in a lot of ways. Um, It has, I still, to honestly, have not really processed that whole situation. Um, I think, you know, Marquise's killer got 20 years in jail, Mm -hmm. in prison rather. Um, 20 years isn't going to bring this man's and this mama's son back. And he died for nothing. And um, I think it's the insidiousness of white supremacy and racism. Um, And, you know, he was shot and killed in front of his five-year-old son. You have a daughter, right? Yes. And how old is your daughter? She will be four in June. So... I think little Marquise had just turned five, like literally just turned five, Mm. literally just turned five. So you're going in there with your kid for a snack after school. And you see your partner getting pushed up on by a man because you pulled into a spot and had the, your car on. And any man, any protector would have been like, hey, hey, what are you doing? Like, why are you pulling up on my my woman like that? Right. Um, and to be killed, it, I, I have not processed that. Um, 
because it should never have happened. And maybe, but for that happening, I don't know if we would even be having this conversation today. And for me, when it happened, I had just recently gotten into a relationship with the person that is now with the person that is now my daughter's mother. And we had a and we had a conversation around it because that's essentially we met each other in movement spaces. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it, it it put the both of us in a headspace of whether we want to whether we want to admit it or not this can happen mm -hmm. you're going to get a, some coke or a sprite or ginger ale and some chips and a mm -hmm. candy bar I, 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 and we I, had to I, the police to, to arrest this man but if if his shooter looks like 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 us, I can tell you 100%, there would be no, you get to sleep in your bed for 24, for four nights. You'd be down at 49th, which is where our jail is. You'd be down at 49th immediately. Right. And I would be talking to you in a holding cell, not in, not, not your lawyer being able to talk to you over the phone. And then your lawyers, white men, demonizing Mr. McLaughlin. You know, every, think of every racial, ep, like racial, like epithet and like of the big black buck type thing talking about him. And that's what, that's what happened during the trial. And then every, you know, idea of a black ghetto woman, to a baby mama about his partner, like be for real. Um, I, I'm gonna say I haven't really processed it. So, you know, thank you. Thank you, Jamal. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I haven't really, I mean, it's just, it's just, and I think for me, it's just like, I haven't processed it because I've had to continue to do the work. I've had to continue to do the work. And and I think that's, I think that's the key piece to it. Like I, I, I can't tell you how many conversations that I've had since my daughter has been born with her mother, where it's been like, Somebody approached me today about the fact that you work, you work for these people and you need to be careful because of X, because of X, Y, Z, or your family needs to be careful or, mm -hmm. and, it, and, it, and it's, and it's like, this is coming from a space of the color of my skin, but also the work I do. I will tell you this. I am less concerned about my clients who are, who, who allegedly may be drug dealers, allegedly may have killed someone. Then I'm less worried about them knowing where I live than some of these other people who may be sanctioned by the state. That's mm -hmm. all I'll say. I am less worried about them knowing the address to my home than I am about some of these other people. Because they because the, those clients that you are less worried about are the ones that's probably actually gonna hold you down in certain spaces that 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 you're in when you're when you're not operating as attorney Rainer or mm -hmm. representative Rainer, but when you just Michelle and you hanging out with and you hanging out with the homies on the weekend. Hang out with the homies over at the catalyst. Which is um if you are in St. Pete you should go see that. Shout out. <laughs> In, in the hood, 22nd, the catalyst, great spot on the deuces. Someone tried to pull up on me. One of my, I didn't even realize my client was in there. I, I, don't do too much about her. Don't do too much. That's why I'll forever, forever, forever. It's always black people for me. Even when y'all get on my nerves, it's always black people for me. You get on my nerves. Yes, absolutely. I mean, y'all so do the most. So y'all do the most. <laughs> <laughs> so in so in so in being a part of this and not not just Marquise, but many of the other clients that you have represented that that dealt with this. Um, how much of this played a part in the decision that you made to 
run for state house in in 2020. Yeah, I mean, that was a wild time. <laughs> so what, <laughs> what happened is that I was actually called by Ben Crump, who is my good friend and brother. And he, you know, I think that people have a lot of criticism of him and they don't really um, take the time to actually watch how he moves. Like he's one of the very few black male attorneys that actually puts black women attorneys, pushes us to the forefront. Mm -hmm. Um, he has pushed me in spaces that I didn't think that I would be in. We have worked cases where he's like, I'm going to put my name on it so people will pay attention, but you got it, sis. I'm out. Um, he was like, this seat is open. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing it. And at the time, um, I was married to my wife and I was like, um, I'm also queer. Like, I, you know, um, uh, I'm like queer, queer. Like I had a husband, I had a wife. Like I, I, I no, like we're not going to do, like this is not a thing. And that my first um, divorce was very public, very messy. I said, you know, I kind of want to lay low. Like I've been trying to keep my life like under wraps. Um, and um, I was like, no, I think you should do it. Like we need smart people. We need lawyers, like blah, 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 blah. And I said, let me think about it. And I came to a church here in my district and he basically like kind of used it as a soft launch of my campaign. And I'm looking at him like, are you crazy? <laughs> um, and he wrote me my first check and um, I announced and within the first 12 hours, I raised like uh, $20,000 for so for a state house raise within the first 10 to 12 hours raising. We hadn't even done. And then I think in 24, we ended up raising like, I don't know, like 30 or 40. Um, it was like unheard of, right? Like, and um, I didn't know what I was doing. And I think for me, and then COVID happened. Um, and then... I suspended my campaign and I started organizing because I was like, people don't have food. People can't have this, they don't have that. And then um, we learned about Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and then eventually, unfortunately, George Floyd. So I feel like it was like kind of meeting a moment that I know it was a moment that I was going to need to meet. And again, I suspended my campaign. I helped the Dream Defenders organize a bail fund to get folks out of um, custody because people were getting arrested for simply exercising their First Amendment right to protest, right? right. Um, and so I just was doing the work. And um, I think, you know, for me, I didn't look at it like, oh, like you're going to be the first person to do this. Like i would had none of that in my mind. I didn't even know that was in my mind. I didn't you know. Other people were telling me like, Hey, since I think you finna be the first queer black woman, openly queer black woman to do great. I don't know. Like, I just know my people need, my people need vaccines and food. And, um, some folks can't work. We need to make sure they have canned foods. People need masks. People need this. People need that. I'm working with community folks here, like heart shout out to Carla Bristol in, um, in the, the St. Pete youth farm shout out to, you know, other folks, um, down in, um, Sarasota and Manatee counties, right. Shout out to folks in Hillsborough County, right. We're just trying to figure out how to organize and put all of our, like, you know, brother John and Jabbar, you like trying to put, figure out how to put all of our, our resources together. And so for me, it was like, you know what, like if I get elected, great, you know, I'm going to get elected doing the work. If I'm not going to get elected, I was still doing the work. And, you know, I was in a four person race. There's another person in that race named Michelle. <laughs> so like, it's not wild that was. So, I mean, obviously I knew it was God because you had to be intentional to vote for me. I was at the last, I was at the bottom of the ballot. The, the, there was another Michelle ab above me. And you had to be intentional to vote for me. It was like, there was not, you know what I mean? There was like three women, one, one guy, and there was, and I was at the bottom, right? So you had to be very intentional to vote for me. And so, um, and I think that for me, it just, it was never about what that means. And like, that's why like when people are like, oh, this is Rep Rainer, blah, 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 blah. I'd be like, it's Michelle and she's a white Republican. And then I'm like, no, it's representative, what's up? But um, other than that, other than that, I, I, I am who I am. I'm Michelle. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm very clear about who I am and like what I do, but mm -hmm. I don't have to do that and put on for people if that makes sense. No, absolutely. Um, and, and that was, 2020 was the year 2020 was the year that I was first introduced to 
you. Like we personally were introduced to each other a, a year later at an, at an event in mm-hmm. in St. Pete. Shout out to AJ again. Um, but 2020 was like the first year I was introduced to you. It was it was the um, as I like to call it the the tri- the trifecta of, of excellence. Um, you. Angie Nixon, and then on the state Senate side, um, the um, Chevron Jones. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, it's, it's the three of y'all for me. So yes. it's like, and now we've added Ashley Gant, yes. now, and then we've added LeVon Bracey Davis. <laughs> I forget, we get shout out to my boy Travis McCurdy, who was with us, and now he's running for. Um, city commissioner. So, and just remind me, I got to send him some money. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was some, there was, there's a handful of us who were very unapologetic in how we show up. Very, very much. And, and that was the thing, that was the thing that drew me to y'all. I was like, yo, no, like, they're just like, they're just like me. And, and we and we we have been punished for it. I mean, we were punished by Republican leadership um, for um, for showing up. I think some of us more than others, right? Um, obviously, I know you have my um, home girl um, Rep Nixon on here, but like, you know, like money money not given to our communities because of how we show up. Money, um, you know, bills not being heard. You know folks being put in a basement, you know, all those kinds of things. And you have to be, you you have to be very clear on how you, how you want to show up. And I think that with that, you have to be also very mindful. Respectability politics pays a lot, even with our people, right? Um, You know, our people, like, unfortunately, because of the lack of access to resources and things that they need, because you have people who are more concerned with power than actually the equitable care of folks that our people play a lot into respectability policies. I get told every other day how I should and should not show up. And I'm like, okay, thank you. I used to get really like, I used to take that real like to heart. I'm like, oh my God. And now I'm like, okay, thank you. Thank you for your, your input. You shouldn't wear this. You don't, you're running for this. You shouldn't do this. You Why, why you do this? Why you show? Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I- how does it make because you know Rep Nixon, Angie, first guest on first guest on the show, explains to us um because when she came on the show, it literally was the end of it was the end of session. It was like right. three days after session had ended. I, and she she had the stamina. I didn't have it. I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> I was like, I can't. <laughs> like, how how explain explain the feeling that you have. Going into this session and having to go back home, knowing that black representatives within the state only get under three percent of the the state budget to take back home to take care of the people that you all represent. That the people that are still full citizens of the state of Florida, just like everybody else. Okay, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's it feels shitty, right? Um, and it even the ones and it's so crazy because, you know, there are folks that um, who are currently running against um, Ashley Gant and I'm not going to say their name, but other mm-hmm. folks who are who have ran against me that were like, I'm able to get things done. OK, so great. You bring home 18 million. Right. There are Republicans that bring home 30, 40, 50 million and 18 million in a hundred and fifty billion dollar budget is no money. Like. Right. So you also have people that will, as I like to say, lay on their backs and be, or as they, or as they like to call the person that's running against Ashley Gant, uh, our boy. And I'm a, I don't know about you. You a gross 75 year old man. You gonna let another man call, white man call you a boy. That, that's, between, that's between you and Jesus. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't know parts, but, um, it's a lot of voter education. And I think I think the people that elected me knew who they elected, right? They knew exactly who they elected. They knew they knew what I was about. They knew who they elected. They know what I'm about. They know who I who they elected. And when they no longer want to elect me, that is fine. So also, I think the other part is I don't hold this that this is like Representative Rayner is not my identity. It is a job that I hold. It's a privilege that I have. It is an honor that I have. But I'm very clear. And I think that you differentiate that with the people that um, keep coming back and like the people like the person that's running against Representative Gant. Um, right. 
And I, I think that it's a lot of voter education. And then when you start to educate people, so I do town halls, like uh, Sean, Sean, who's just on your show, he jokes to me. He's like, Michelle, you town hall people to death. I said, I town hall them to death because I need them to know what's going on. So you can't say I didn't know, because even if you weren't there, your neighbor will be like, well, I just saw Representative Rainer and she was blah, 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 blah. Or I just saw her on her Facebook. She was blah, 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 blah. Cool. And so it's just education. And so for me, I can make sure I can go to sleep at night. I, I, listen, listen. That's how, that's how I get down. Yes. And I told you, like, we haven't even really gotten knee deep into the conversation yet, and it's already awesome. So, um, 2022 rolls around and you decide, you know what? Uh, I kind of want to do Washington now. I I, I, kind of want Washington to be a thing. Mm -hmm. And then... Our friend, my no, that's my friend, my friend and yours, <laughs> Ronald Dion De- DeSantis. Um, interesting fact: you are the person that made me know what this man's middle name is. Because like, anybody knows me personally, <laughs> any, anyone that's going to listen to this and knows me personally, I call people by what they mama named them. If I if you if I find out what your mama names you, that's why. And especially, like, I will call you by that. There, you know, I have friends right now that be like, "Why you be calling me that? That's what your mama names you." I'm not gonna call you what everybody else. Call. I'm gonna call you what your mama names you. <laughs> so I call. That's what the man name is. His name is Ronald Dion. That's what I'm gonna Ronald call him. And also sometimes, like you know, when you used to get in trouble with your mama, and she would say your whole name, whole name, and because you were you were in some foolishness and some mess that you shouldn't have been in. That's how I feel about him. That's like. <laughs> Your mama didn't say your whole name the whole, enough to let you know you was in some foolishness. So when you stop being in foolishness, I may call you Ron, but since you're in foolishness, it's Ronald Dion. And I can talk because he, he signed most of my stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> Ronald Dion. Shout out to the shout, shout out. Um he drew these maps up. And so, I mean, so it's the first time anybody's done that as a governor. I ain't never seen it, but continue. That one. So um the seat that you were originally going to run for in Congress was Charlie Chris's seat. Mm-hmm. And it was due to the fact that Charlie Chris was running for governor. Right. You decided, hey, I'm going to do this Congress thing. And I was like, oh, you know, uh-huh. let's, let's go. Like, we about to, like, we about to do this. I'm about to, I'm about to uh-huh. you know, I'm about, I'm about to have friends in high place, high, high place. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And then these maps happened. Mm-hmm. And we were like, okay, let's 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 go let's let's go back to let's go back to Tallahassee. Let's go back to Tallahassee now. What's your initial feeling? You know, because I, I feel like you had the same feeling as everyone else who who looked at this situation and was like, why why are you doing this? But what's your initial feeling? Because the maps have a direct effect on you running for Mm -hmm. Congress. Yeah, I mean, so this is a great place to clear the record. I was recruited heavily by folks to to run for Congress. Um, I'm not going to name organizations or entities, but suffice it to say, I was recruited heavily to run for Congress. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a lot of prayer. (laughs) It was a lot of consideration. Um, a lot of conversations with me and my then partner. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it was a lot. I think that, and I did it because it felt, the timing felt right. The math made sense. Mm -hmm. And, um, I said, okay, maybe this is a, a way that I can serve the people in my community. Um, and when Ronald Dion decided to get involved in the in the creating the maps, I think he did it for a couple of reasons. One, he was running for he was he was running for president, so his whole thing was is like you know he wanted to be able to give you know a, the path of presidency always runs through Florida, no matter what anybody says. Florida is always in play, Absolutely. and so if you could knock out 
um, with Al Lawson up north, right, and knock out another Democrat here in uh, here in the Tampa Bay area that changes the 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 configuration of the Florida delegation again. Mm -hmm. And I think he did that um, because it was unheard of. It's unprecedented um, that a governor draws his own map. It's literally unprecedented. And we see that the litigation that has been going on with regard to that. And I mean, and it's the other way to gerrymander and to to silence black people's voices. Right. Because the way that the new district was was done, that it basically leaves out black representation and makes it from and went from a Biden plus four to. Uh, so for those who don't know that, meaning that uh, President Biden would have won won the district as it was previously drawn by four points, meaning it was a more Democratic leaning district and made it now a Trump plus like seven, Trump plus nine, I think, which means that as the district is currently drawn, that Donald Trump won that district uh, by nine points. And that is an incredibly red part of the county. And um, so it had to make sense, right? And I had to really think about after the maps were done, was I just done with public service, period? Or do I pivot and go back to, to Tallahassee? And that was a lot of prayer. And I'm going to tell you, like, it didn't feel good because I didn't, you know, I'm not a, I'm not that kind of kid that like, you know, just stop like quits, right? I'm not the kind of kid that's just like, okay, you know, and I didn't want to look like, like loosey goosey. I didn't want to look like a double-minded person. Um, and so that was a lot of like thought and a lot of conversation and, and really talking to my mother who was alive at the time of saying like, you know, I, it's, you always have the ability to pivot. And at the end of the day, it's going to be up to the people, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be up to the people if they want to send you back to us. And they did, you know, I won that race by 15 points. Right. Um, and, and it was a three person race and someone who had ran several times here in St. Pete, who had been elected before ran against me, who was my, uh, a predecessor and I, I I won by 15 points. So I think it was I think people were very clear what they wanted, what they did not want, right? And but you know it is it I'll say that it's you know off the table. It's off the table for now. I actually really enjoy the work that I'm doing in Tallahassee. It's very hard. It's very grueling. It is very um it's very grueling work. Um I am not home more often than I am home, right? And so I um you know, but I, I'm very clear that this is where I'm supposed to be until I'm no longer supposed to be there. And when I'm no longer supposed to be there, I will move to wherever, you know, God has for me to go next. And and, and for us who understood the pro for us who understood the process and were able to explain it better, better to people. Um, I think for us, we looked at it not as you making the, the the pivot or flip flopping, we looked at it as the the opportunity to be a representative on a federal level was taken away because somebody felt that they had a false sense of power mm -hmm. and decided that uh, no, like we we we're gonna we're going to essentially give Florida to whomever the Republican yeah. candidate is. Um, and that's how we, and, and that's, and, and that's honestly how we, that's how we looked at it. And, you know, that's how we looked at it in the case of the, 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 the long C5 no longer being mm -hmm. thing. Um, and also one of the, the districts down in, in South Florida, like no, no mm -hmm. longer being a thing. It was just, it was just like, Oh, so this is what you we're feel, doing. You feel this is how you run in the show. Okay. Right. And um, it was unprecedented. And I mean, and I think that, you know, we got a longer conversation, obviously not today, but about how this is how this particular administration has has moved um in in the governorship. Yeah. Um so you have an involvement in an awesome organization known as the National Black Justice Coalition mm -hmm. that since 2003 has been America's leading national civil rights organization dedicated to the empowerment of Black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer plus, and same gender loving people, including people living with HIV AIDS through coalition building, federal policy change, 
research and education. Mm -hmm. Um, You gave me the distinct, you, I'm going to personally say you, um, you gave me the distinct honor of meeting the Dr. David Johns <laughs> um, during the time period that we were doing the whole Stop Stop the Black Attack campaign. Um, we had like a close, we had a closed door meeting in the FEA office in Tallahassee. And I just remember all of a sudden you come walking in and this in- incredibly well-dressed, well-manicured ha- man comes walking in behind you. Baby, um, he's fine. That's my baby. He's fine. <laughs> listen, listen. Numerous times I've seen this man on um, on The Breakfast Club with mm-hmm. Mark Lamont Hill, all the things. And the first thing I notice is his fingernails, his nails are all are oh, impeccable goodness. every time. And... Um, you know, we sit down and we're all having these conversations and everything. And I and I just said in the meeting, I was just like, yo, like I just really feel like eventually if we're gonna shake some things up and we're gonna have people like recognize what's going on, some of us gonna have to get arrested up in it. And mm-hmm. I and I remember him just like, you know, he was on his phone, he was leaning there talking to you, and then all of a sudden I said this, and he was just like. No, you have more to say. Mm-hmm. Say 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 some things. You have more to say. And I was just like, okay, you know, mm-hmm. this is this is Dr. Johns. Um explain your in, in involvement in the mm-hmm. org and how is that relationship between the, the the two of you, especially as it pertains to the work when it comes to um, MB, MBJC? So definitely don't want to start crying, um, but a good cry. Um, David Jones has changed my life in a lot of ways. You asked me my top five organizers. He was one of them. Mm, mm. Um, I would be also remiss not to mention Victoria Kirby York, who is his right hand person, human. Um, yes. Little black woman organizer, lesbian, like uh, same gender loving human who they literally pushed me to be a better version of myself. They literally pushed me to lean into things that are uncomfortable. They literally pushed me to lean into work that is uncomfortable. They have literally held it down with even this last session with white led uh, LGBT organizations were trying to come for me. And they were like, absolutely not. We're not going to allow that to happen. Um, They, the resources that they provide to us. I mean, I just, and when I say changed my life, like it, it literally there are people that I am so honored to know that um, have pushed me to think more rigorous, rigorously and more critically and more, focused in on things. And he's one of those people. There's never not a time, even if we're just hanging out and kicking it and like laughing and cackling that I don't leave somewhat changed and somewhat better. And, um, I think that he is a gift. I think the organization is a gift. I think that folks like Victoria Kirby York, who is a like fucking phenomenal, like strategist and communicator um, and messenger, uh, I mean, and just is able to look at things. They also, I what I love is that they're not stingy about putting their people in spaces uh, of influence and putting them people in spaces of being on. And I think that to me, they're a model, I feel like, of what movement orgs should look like when you when your ego is not in it, right? When your mm-hmm. ego is not and you know sometimes in movement people's egos be really in it and people be like why are like you'd be like no one asked you to do that absolutely um, and um it's 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 a model of that so um i mean i think mbjc holds an incredible incredible space that is needed um you know shout out to hrc like love them you know uh trevor project but there is a space to be able that has to be for black folks to talk about gender identity, 
to talk about queerness, to talk about same gender loving, because we've always been here, right? right. There's never been not a thing. We've always been here. Mm-hmm. And I think to be able to have that conversation and, you know, even having folks like Ben Crump on the board and other, you know, um, heterosexual straight allies or, and accomplices on the board allows those conversations to happen. It It has given me language to even have a conversation with people instead of being like, I'm tired. I'm not going to talk to you about it. Like, right. Cause sometimes I'm like, I don't want, you know, even when as someone who is queer, someone who is pan, someone who I like, who I like, I, I date who I date, you know, having those conversations. And then also saying, I don't have to come out to you. You know, even the, when we think about inviting in, right. Like when you, and, and I think that having the language of, you don't just because I may be public frontward facing. I don't necessarily have to invite you in. You don't have to know who I'm seeing, what I got going on. None of that until I invite you in. And inviting in is not necessarily I'm ashamed of being. It is just simply saying you don't get to have access to that part of me. And so I think that what they have done as an organization, how they've supported electives like myself and Sharon Jones and um, Malcolm Kenyatta. And I, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, I think it has just been absolutely tremendous. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it's an organization I will forever love and be a part of and have the deepest respect for. One of the things that I remember distinctively ab- about you um occurred in occurred in 2000 occurred in 2023 and actually occurred in April of 2023 I I know this because it was the day that um Black Voters Matter had our day at the Capitol um you know you came you, you came through for your friend once again mm-hmm. as you do many of times for me I appreciate you um but we were sitting all of us who organized for Black Voters Matter we were sitting in a chamber and I think this was the day that they decided they want to pass don't say gay 2.0 or whatever again. Mm-hmm. But that day you stood on the house floor mm-hmm. and on your phone, you read the names of countless individuals within the LGBTQ community who had died. We have been murdered at the the hands of either state state sanctioned violence or just violence, yeah, violence. Um, specifically, and, and trans, specifically trans women at the hands of just white supremacist ignorance and violence. We'll put it that way. Um, how much does that drive? not just the work you do as a legislator, but the work you do as an organizer and the decisions that you make as far as the the, legis- the legislation you support. I will say this and I will continue to say this. We're not going to be free until Black trans women are free. Full stop. They are the most marginalized of us. They are the most victimized of us. They are the most, they will, are the ones that will be the most harmed by any adverse legislation. So until they are free, none of us are free. Until the most marginalized of us are free, none of us are free. So I I attempt as a cis gender queer woman, I attempt to look at the framing of everything that I do, how I vote, the legislation I propose through that lens. Sometimes I get it right. Hopefully I get it right more than I get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, if you are going to harm people, you're going to know who they are. And I, and you, in the words of Ashley Gann, I talk about her a lot. She's my, one of my dearest friends and my roommate. She said, she always says, if I'm uncomfortable, we all going to be uncomfortable. Period. Full stop. Yeah, I've heard her say that. We all going to be uncomfortable. I have heard her say that countless times too. But yeah. On the house floor. No. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. We all gonna we be all gonna be uncomfortable. I heard her say it one time on the house floor, and I was like, Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> For real. Oh. Um, 
This is the last question I'm going to ask. This is the last question that I always ask um, each episode. Uh, State Rep. Michelle Rayner, mm-hmm. what is your vision of a Florida where Black people are able to live in freedom, equity, and authenticity? Uh, (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if I've really taken the time to imagine that. Because I think you have to work backwards. When you think about what happens when we win, and I have a friend, Reverend Dr. Baranda, Berlanda Ferdamin, who is a wonderful Afro uh, Latina Black woman who talks a lot about this and says, What happens when we win? But sometimes you have to work backwards and think about the things that we had to do to get to victory, to get to liberation. And I think if I work backwards, there's a sense of community. There's a sense of community care. There's a sense of um, a collective sharing of experience. There is a sense of not tolerance is an awful word and acceptance is an awful word. This an ex- but there's a sense of just love and love meaning whoever you love. I, I'm I'm down with it. Whoever Mm -hmm. I'm down with it. There's a sense of a a community collective self determination. I think a lot of the principles that we talk about in Kwanzaa are would be would be evident. Um, There is the system not looking the way it does, right? And I think a lot of times that people like myself and Rep Nixon and Chevron Jones and Ashley Gain and LeVon Bracey Davis and Venture Striscoll and Sean Shaw, we, we, we are working within the system that, that we're given. Right. Mm-hmm. So what does it look like to actually change the system? Right. So I think that for me, I, I, I don't necessarily think about what happens, what it looks like when we win. Right. I think about how we get there. And I think the best book for anybody to really think about that is the parable of the sower box to Octavia Butler. Um, that really talks, that really gives you that, that vision. Um, I I, I, I don't know. I I don't know, but I know that it can't continue to be like this. And sometimes, um, I tend to be of the, of the belief that you have to sometimes burn it all down for it to be rebuilt. Two things. First off, I appreciated the I appreciate the fact that you stated I don't know because I haven't had the time to imagine that yet because that's the sentiment of most black people when you ask them that question mm-hmm. when you ask them the very question I asked you black people don't have the luxury to to reimagine a world that is for us by us. You know, I, they 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 tell us that the the imagery of Wakanda it, is is the closest thing, but even Wakanda had its had its issue, had its issues and its problems. Um so for you to say that first and foremost acknowledges the acknowledges acknowledges the authenticity in your answer because sometimes we don't have that we don't have that luxury of being able to to reimagine um that world mm-hmm. um and then for me in creating what essentially is this movement known as Black Florida BLK FLA um the word authenticity was put in the question on purpose because we can we can give black people 
equitable opportunities. We can live in a place of freedom. But if each Black person that's a part of this world and in this movement isn't able to be the, their authentic selves, then what are we really doing? Mm-hmm. Are, are we really are we really free? Mm-hmm. Um, and so in me having what I call the elite eight, which are the eight first eight guests that influence either this podcast, this movement, or just Black organizing in Florida in general, it was necessary for me to have you because you've, you've been one of the most authentic people that we have ever seen in this Black political movement that we have here in the state of Florida. And you've always been unapologetically authentic in the way that you move. Um, and these are things, and these are things that we share with each other on a on a on a public stage, on a private stage, what have you. But I I have always admired and revered you, not just as the elected official, but as the person. Thank you. I appreciate that. Of course. I'm glad it's recorded. So when I have them hard days, I'm going to replay that back. (laughs) Period. Um, So that's it, y'all. This is Jamal still showing y'all love and appreciation for joining us on this BLK FLA experience. Stay free, stay blessed, and continue to get acquainted with greatness. We'll see y'all next time. Bye. Bye. Did you know I'm too deaf on my mind, I'm about to bring it to you. If revolution was a movie, I'd be themed. Time to ignite what I spit. It's light and fluid. Shedding into it, fits ways such a glorious design. Walking into the biggest fight of our lives. Time to spoil the revolution. <laughs>